Hello. Hi, Andre. What are you gonna fry? Hey, Shannon. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. What Shannon is referring to is, um, uh, to me attending the LA County Fair this, uh, Sunday. I'm excited. I'm gonna bring a shoe, and I'm gonna fry it, and I'm gonna eat yes. it. Um, but... Before I continue with that, hi, Shannon, how are you? Um, not as good as you, because that will not be happening to me. Um, but <laughs> I'm doing good, you know, same as usual, kind of like grandma. <laughs> I mean, listen, grandmas do pretty good from what I see. They get to chillax, they um, bake and eat cookies, um, they get visits from their grandsons and grand daughters um sounds like a swell time to me i don't know about you yeah really no i'm i'm gonna be knitting a scarf um this month and i'm working on my halloween dress so that's happening with the old sewing machine um yeah just Ooh, what are you being for well, halloween i had planned to be red riding hood just because like i just happened to find cheap fabric that looked exactly like that but um as we've discussed before, I'm not that good at sewing, so we'll see if it happens. <laughs> okay, well, I'm burning for you. Um, uh, hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 36. <sighs> episode 36, it sounds so good. <laughs> um, uh, we got something spooky for you today. We got some good stuff for you today. Shannon and I are excited to be talking to you. Um, uh, okay, quick aside. Um, Shannon and I were talking about It Chapter 2, and I guess it's fitting since we're a scary podcast. <laughs> Um, uh, Shannon, want to give just like a quick, quick summary of your qualification of your, of your rating to What's it? What's a qualification? I think, no, I meant qualification. Qualification. What the fuck was that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, I think my brain is like short wiring right now. I meant another word. I'm going to find it and I'm going to tell it to you in okay, a minute. But okay. go ahead. Explain, explain just what okay, you thought well, of it. Well, just in one word, six so six out of ten and i had a really long discussion about this after seeing it and obviously with you um and i just feel like the majority of the movie was super unnecessary and i think what we settled on is it should have been different entirely like they should have just gone in a different direction because at this point like we get it you know like i'm not saying it was horrible yeah. like i enjoyed myself like it was fine and like ooh, spooky stuff like a naked old lady um who looks like me in the morning um <laughs> but in general like i just wasn't very impressed because yeah yeah um so i mean so i understand your rating of was it six, six? out of ten six out of ten um uh yeah, I get it. I mean, I th I said I, I gave it like a 7 or 7.5 just because I think it sounds to me like I had more fun watching it than you did. But once I dissect its structure and like its writing, I'm like, eh. Um, I thought that maybe the sequel should have done should have been done with just the kids just because it was hard for me to care at all about the adult characters. And I understand that they were trying to like finish the book that they started, but like, I don't know. The first movie stands on its own to me, so really, they could have just forgotten about the adult sequel and just done another movie with the kids, and that would have been probably a hit, yeah. too. Um, yeah, I mean, the fact that they needed to include the adult... I mean, the fact that they that, that this was about the adults without them having had any prior introduction in the first movie um, like meant that in order for audiences to care, I feel like the filmmakers had to like cram in a bunch of like flashback childhood scenes about the adults and that made the movie so long um so that was a problem and all um, those also sorry. like all those flashback scenes were completely unnecessary stuff that could have been in the first movie if they wanted it to and just the whole memory cop out was really lame like there's a reason we didn't see those flashbacks none of them were inherently important to the original story anyway it was just like let's pay the kids which is fine but like why yeah anyway yeah um, I mean, they probably didn't include them in the first movie because they needed some fodder to include in the second one for the flashback scenes. Like, they probably already knew. Like, they probably knew from the get-go this is going to be the structure of the second film, which is kind of unfortunate. Um, but, I mean, uh, but I did think it was scary. I thought Pennywise was really good. Like, Bill Skarsgård as Pennywise is really good. Um, I thought that... <laughs> I thought that James McAvoy was kind of lame. <laughs> yeah. I thought that um, Jessica Chastain was kind of lame. I thought Bill Hader was okay. I thought like the adult fat kid was good. And um, oh, we we didn't talk at all about um, what's his name, Bill, Eddie? Um, the black no, oh, kid. Oh, Mike. 
Eddie, no. Mike. Mike. Um, the adult actor was like, all right, I guess. Um, I oh, I also heard that because I haven't read the book. Apparently, they took out like a big part of the explanation of like Pennywise's background, yeah. like because he's like this old ass alien. But apparently, in like the book, like he comes from some like ancient faraway planet um, where he was like exiled because he like tried to like fight with the creator of the universe which is like this huge <laughs> magical turtle like it's yeah. a whole thing <laughs> like Stephen King really went for it with this book um, but I think it's fine that it wasn't included just because like the movie was already so long like I can't imagine yeah. no <laughs> um, I mean granted it didn't have to be that long if the fil- filmmakers didn't want it to be um like, all the scare scenes with the adults, like, one after the other, after the other, after the other. Like, that didn't have to be that way. They didn't have to have that. But, whatever. Um, yeah. I mean, it's seven. Seven out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah. I mean, I really am not sweating the whole um, intergalactic stuff because it was already too much. But, um yeah, like talk about it, even a bigger tone shift than just having adult characters. It's like, no, let's go to the other end of the universe and watch a spider fight a turtle. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, beyond that, hi everyone again, episode 36. Today we are talking about curses. Um, uh, curses, like the one I'll be placing on Shannon at the end of this episode. <laughs> Um, so tune in for that. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, everyone, get in the mood. Um, grab your popcorn, sip your tea. I don't know what the kids do nowadays. Sit the fuck down. I'm going to talk to you about a couple of curses. So the first one I want to talk about is um, Timur's Tomb. Now, have you heard about Timur? No, I haven't. Um, uh, so Timur was a uh, Mongolian ruler in 14th century Asia. He um, was a uh, big military tactician at the time, and he was responsible for the death of around 17 million people. What? Um, so Hitler is shaking right now. Um, he lived for 68 years, which is a long ass time for the 13th century. Um, and he built uh, the biggest dynasty after Genghis Khan. Um, uh, his tomb is an important piece of history and culture, uh, in Mongolian history, in Mongolian, like, architecture. Um, and so, again, he had this big-ass tomb, and the tomb, um, or rather the m- mausoleum where he lies, um, is, um, was an inspiration for, like, a bunch of tombs afterwards. So, basically, he's a big deal. Um, now, okay. More detail. So this tomb is in uh, Uzbekistan, um, and it is uh, very cursed, and I want to talk to you about that. Okay, so in 1941, um, the a couple of Russian anthropologists were in Uzbekistan uh, on Stalin's order um, trying to find this tomb, and they found it. And uh, at the time, um, what the archaeologists, what the, sorry, what the anthropologists wanted to do um was try to like find the tomb find the body and try to reconstruct timur's uh face from his skull um so like that was the goal and they were there on a mission by stalin in the 40s and he was like okay go do that find him and do your reconstruction and they were like okay so they find the tomb uh again in uzbekistan and uh, uh stalin orders the anthropologist team um, his anthropologist team to open the tomb on June 20th of 1942. Um, according to testimony, the tomb was immediately filled with odor of camphor, resin, rose, and frankincense. Um, uh, research letters show that this was just like because of the embalming oils they used on the mummy. Um, but it was still creepy, so I guess it's worth mentioning. Um, that two days after the Soviets opened the tomb, uh, Hitler and the Nazis invaded wow. Russia. Now, why do I mention this? Basically, the tomb's curse, it's really short. It basically says something along the lines of, like, whoever disturbs my tomb is going to unleash an invader more terrible than I. Wow. Um, you know what's happening right now? Everything is just setting the vibe what? for the beginning of the next Avengers movie. Um, <laughs> and you know what? I wouldn't be surprised if this is exactly what happens. 
<laughs> um, oh, I found the inscriptions. Okay, so another one um, that was written on the tombstone said, When I rise from the dead, the world shall tremble. So, I guess both of them were right. He was unearthed, and the world trembled <laughs> because an invader worse than him, more terrible, came and unleashed his wrath upon the world, and that was Hitler um, on Russia, and it makes sense that it was Russia because it was Stalin that ordered the anthropologist team to unearth this tomb, and so now they have to live with the consequences of their actions. So, you know, as fate would have it, the Nazis invaded Russia a couple days later. The invasion came out of nowhere. No formal declaration of war, if you'll remember from history class. Um, uh, the operation was Operation Barbarossa. At this point, I'm just giving you guys an unnecessary history lesson that no one wants, so I'm going to stop. Um, basically, they unearth this thing. Hitler invades Russia. Russia suffers for some time. Um, uh, Soviets, after uh, Stalin, after a couple years, is like, okay, um, this is fucked up. Maybe the tomb did have something to do with it. I'm starting to become convinced that maybe it did have something to do with it. So anthropologist team go back and rebury this thing with like full Islamic burial rites. We want to make sure we do it right. Like return Timor, please. Um, the Soviets did that, and guess what? Uh, nearly a month later, the Nazis surrender, and Stalin won the Battle of Stalingrad, and um, lit. <laughs> So, I, and listen, I don't know, I don't know what you, like, take from this. To me, though, this was legit. Like, I mean, I don't know. This is kind of, isn't it kind of strange? Like, uh, I guess, but it was kind of a vague inscription. Like, it also, like, what if there was an earthquake? Isn't it the same thing as the earth trembling? I mean, yes, I guess it's kind of vague. I don't know that he meant an earthquake, though. Old timey rulers and terrible fascist leaders usually were very poetic in their words so i think he must have meant like a person like someone's gonna come and make the world tremble at least that's the way i would interpret it um that's certainly the way stalin interpreted after a while of getting his ass beaten um so that's that curse um listen I think it's creepy. I think it's real. I think we've got something going on here. I think y'all should leave Timur alone for the rest of time. Do not disturb that tomb. We're good. We don't need another Hitler. It's fine. Why We're couldn't fine. he be like one of those people who's like, bury me face down so the world can kiss my ass? Like, why can't that be his curse? <laughs> um, I know. Like, what's the, what's the desire to like, have the world like shake and tremble and be in misery the way you put it in misery even after you're dead like who well like who hurt you um, <laughs> who hurt you uh, who hurt you anyway um so that's that i have <laughs> another one that i like it's pretty funny well actually it's not funny at all it's really <laughs> tragic but um <laughs> i just i don't know like i don't know about this one but anyway um uh, have you heard of uh the tick burn doll no i haven't Okay, so the Tickborn doll, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, I think I am. The Tickborn doll actually just by itself isn't a curse. It's just a traditional English festival of charity um, where this like village in uh, in England, it's called Tickborn in Hampshire. Um, it does like this feast, this like Catholic feast, but it's a religious feast. And they, um, they hand out donations of like food to the poor people, local poor people. I mean, nowadays it's just anyone. Uh, but it used to be like back in the what 17th century it was like you know the the local manor of that town like gave out food to poor people uh, actually i should just get into the history of it it'll make more sense so basically um this festival it's called the tickborn doll um it dates back to the 12th century and was started by lady mabella tickborn who on her deathbed this is according to the Wikipedia article, and of course you can trust Wikipedia, instructed that a donation of farm produce be made to the poor each year. Today, the terms of the dole stipulate that adults from the parishes of Tickborn and Cheriton, which is a nearby town, are entitled to claim one gallon of flour and children half a gallon each. So if you're ever low on flour and you find yourself close to Tickborn, Hampshire, you know where to go. <laughs> um, now... This is just kind of like creepy and weird. So I guess when Lady Tickborn back in the 12th century decided on her deathbed that she wanted to like give to the poor, 
I wonder if it's because she had been like a terrible person all her life and now she felt bad. I don't know. That's just stipulation. I just i'm just assuming um anyway when she decided to do this her husband wasn't very happy with this her husband was sir roger tickborn and um because he did not approve of her charity um he was like okay listen i'll let you do it but only it, on the condition that the dole consists only of um produce from land that you my wife who by the way is sick right now um is able to encircle under your own power while carrying a burning torch what the hand. fuck <laughs> <laughs> um, so, <laughs> basically, like, lady was like, I want to give stuff to the poor. The husband was like, um, I don't like that. So, okay, fine, I'll let you do it. But only if you go out to our farm right now that you're poor of health, you go out on to our farm with a torch and you, like, walk the farm and whatever, like, area you encircle, that's the only area, like, that we're going to give out produce from, that we're going to, like, grow it from. But anything else, no. Um, uh, she is said to have successfully crawled around a 23-acre field before the torch wow. went out. The land which she is said to have encircled is known locally as the Crawls. So, interesting piece of information. Uh, the lady uh, had a husband asshole. <laughs> had an asshole husband. And probably also a husband asshole. I mean, listen, I don't know. Um, now, onto the actual curse. So, what happens? So the lady encircles the land. She's like, okay, finally, I'm going to get to the poor. Now I can go back and, like, die. Um, <laughs> the story of the dole holds that Lady Tickborn placed a curse on it after she encircled the cross to ensure that her request would never be abandoned, namely, probably, by her asshole husband. <laughs> uh, according to the curse, as she placed before dying, if the dole were to stop, the Tickborn family would bear seven sons and in the next generation, seven daughters, leading to the family's name being lost and the house falling into ruins. I think that's such a long ass, like, like, why, <laughs> why would you want a curse that takes so yeah. long to, like, manifest? Like, I would just be like, everyone will die. But I get, I, listen, all the time people, they were just poetic in their actions and in their words. So I guess this is the way she wanted to go about it. She was like... The Tickborn family shall have bear seven sons and seven <laughs> daughters, whatever. So, that's the curse. What happens? The dole continues from the time of Lady Tickborn's death until 1796, um, when disturbances during the handing out of the dole led to local officials ordering it to cease. So, at this point, like seven generations had already happened from Lady Tickborn's death up to like the early um, 19th yeah. century. And, okay, so basically, Lady Tickborn dies in the 13th century, sorry, in the 12th century. And then by 1796, so like early 19th century, basically, um, she, her family has had enough generations that there is this guy who is the eldest of seven sons. And this guy has had seven daughters. And uh. this has all been during the time that the doll stopped. So the doll stopped. Um, and, like, the family had, like, the curse, like, was becoming, like, true. Uh, it's pretty scary. And, like, the seven sons and the seven daughters, and now what happens? So, at this point, like, fearing that the curse was coming to fruition, because, like, they saw it happening, like, the, the, the prophecy that was foretold, um, the dole was resumed. Um, and, um, the family name went on because one of the women in the family finally had a son and so the family name didn't die and it's very very complicated because a wikipedia article lists like seven different people that i'm not gonna touch on but basically the family survived the curse because they fucked up and they left the doll but after enough time they were like listen let's pick this up because we are having a bunch of sons and then a bunch of daughters and this ain't looking good so <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. Like, it, listen, proof is in the pudding, or rather, in the farm produce. Uh, and this looks, this looks pretty bad to me. Um, so that's basically the curse. I want to hear your thoughts. Well, I mean, I thought it was a little bit stupid that he was like, yo, you can't do this. Go carry a torch in a circle. I was like, okay, is this just like <laughs> him being like an ass kind of jokingly? And then like over the generations, we kind of were like, no, this actually happened. She actually did it. Um, but, you know, after talking about how many kids and that coincidence, like, I don't know, I kind of buy it just a little bit. I don't want you to get too excited, but that's really, I don't know, like what the odds <laughs> would have to be for that to happen for like this one of the seven sons to have seven daughters like really 
Uh, like what? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, yeah, I think, I think, pretty, pretty slim chance of that happening. Um, I okay, something that was a lot of fun, interesting was apparently. So that's the curse, haha, spooky. But like a side note to that, the doll and the curse. Like, this curse set the groundwork for a very infamous, like, 19th century trial um, called the Tickborn Claimant Trial of the 19th century. And I know we're not, like, a true crime podcast, but I just wanted to touch on this for a second because it's so interesting. Basically, like, <laughs> there was this case in 19th century, like, Victorian England uh, where this man um, claimed to be part of the Tickborn, like, the legacy, like, Baron legacy. Um, and... Like, this guy really tried to convince them, and he, like, used the curse as part of, like, his evidence. He was, like, um, like, Lady Tickborn, like, plays this curse, and she left some, like, if I read this correctly, she, like, left some scripture somewhere about how, like, one of the seven sons would go missing. Like, it was, like, (laughs) this whole fucking thing. In the end, uh, anyway, I just thought it was interesting because the curse was used as, like, part of the evidence for this. Um, The courts were not convinced, though, and this guy was convinced of perjury and served a long prison sentence. He was basically trying to, like, pull an Anastasia on the courts and be like, I am the long-lost baron. Um, I don't know. Um... Like, makes me sad to think that maybe he was. But the courts were like, nah, you're not. You're too fat or something. You don't look like the photo or something. (laughs) And, like, he left a long prison sentence, even though he, like, may have very well actually been the real person. That, ladies and gentlemen, is tragic. Um, This is just a weird side note to that. (laughs) Um, Anyway, um, uh, that's what I have. Shannon, you're up, girl. Well, first of all, I want to say, like, is that, like, the first time we've actually convicted someone of catfishing? Um, um, I doubt it. I honestly doubt <laughs> it. I'm gonna come at you with some examples, like post podcast. I'll set up to you. Oh or my something. god. Okay. Okay. So, um, so <laughs> I just have like a short one and then a really long one. So we okay. kind of had an episode where we talked about cursed objects. Is that what it was, or haunted objects? So yes. I did kind yes. of choose another one of those. It wasn't entirely on purpose like i'm not trying to sabotage us is all i'm saying um but this is technically a curse it is just it's an object so you know whatever it's fine all right (laughs) so the best um research article i could find on this in particular was on xexemplor.com posted june 5th 2019 by writer ann carney so this is the curse of the crying boy painting hmm another painting well actually <laughs> Ooh, i think i may have heard of that one okay yeah yeah, yeah. That sounds so spooky. this is Go actually ahead. not one painting it's a series of paintings um so the crying boy was one of the series and it's by artist giovanni bragolin and he completed these in the 1950s and what kind of happened is that um he painted over 60 paintings of children teary-eyed or in the midst of crying and (laughs) they that's that's fucking weird (laughs) yeah it's weird right but the thing is like they were really popular like people really wanted them so the uk bought over fifty thousand copies like people in the uk um and so Mm. in up until the early 80s they were doing reprints and prints of these images and mass producing them to give to people well you know to sell because capitalism we all want to see a crying child on our wall apparently um (laughs) (laughs) so one of the things that was very distinct about these children was that they were represented as being poor and it's kind of assumed that they're also orphans um so (laughs) Um, there is one that's kind of like the iconic crying boy photo, um, and I can send it to you actually, but, um, I don't know if I'll do that now because I don't know. You can look it up, Andre. (laughs) Just kidding. Yeah, no, I actually, I actually looked it up. Okay. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's just kind of like a, a painting of a little boy crying. It's not that deep, but I mean, clearly it is that deep. So please elaborate. So, (laughs) so obviously like he painted these in the fifties and they were really being sold all around the world in the early eighties. So in 1985, a popular tabloid newspaper in the UK, um, printed a story 
that kind of um, gave like a new spin on it. So it was called Blazing Curse of the Crying Boy, and this was published in The Sun, which still exists today and we talk about. Um, and <laughs> Yep, The Sun still exists yeah, today, up yeah. in the sky, every morning. <laughs> funny, 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 Andre. <laughs> <laughs> that was so sad. Like, huh, funny. So funny. basically, this it kind of creates like this panic of like, okay, this painting that we've had on our wall is cursed. So the story that they talk about in the article is an experience by May and Ron Hall, and their home in Rotterdam is destroyed by a fire, and basically what supposedly caused the fire was a pan overheating and bursting into flames it spread and destroyed everything on the ground floor of the home and the only thing that remains intact was a print of the crying boy on their wall so you know (laughs) and being like disturbed by this whole thing they they claimed that the painting was cursed and it was the cause of the fire i mean whether or not it was is up to you to interpret it could have just been the pan um yeah i mean w- when you talked about like the other painting uh the hands resistant uh-huh. um didn't you mention that like it had also been in like house fires or something and like the firefighters found these paintings or like found a painting and like it wasn't burned but everything else was i don't think so i think maybe there was something similar with it being damaged but the hands resist him was sold online and someone was actually like hoarding it or i think they still are or no i think you i think like you you mentioned when you were like talking about it on the podcast that whoever posted it online like posted it alongside a story oh. of like oh in, in a house fire it didn't it didn't like it didn't have any damage or oh like maybe that. so this sounds similar yeah anyway, no go, i know what you're talking about though there's definitely a story that went along with that um so this would have just been like whatever you know but then a firefighter came mm-hmm. forward and he said, well, actually, I had been at 15 house fires where everything was destroyed. And in these house fires, the only thing left complete was the crying boy. Um, <laughs> and so, Ugh, yeah. I hate that. <laughs> so this really just came, you know, like people were coming forward and saying like, oh, yeah, this happened to me, too. Or this there was a fire over the UK. There was all these fires over the UK and it was all blamed on the cursed child. And so what happened was the sun was publishing mostly all of these. So the sun was like a huge perpetrator of making this curse either exist for one by getting people to lie or by at least recording it in its existence. And so one woman in Surrey, Mm. she said that she lost her house um, uh, to a fire in six months after buying the painting. Um, Two sisters in Kilburn had fires in their homes after buying a copy of the painting. One sister even claimed to have seen her painting sway backwards and forwards on the wall. Um, which I don't know what that means exactly. Ooh. Like, how would it sway backwards and forwards? Like, I don't, I don't know. It doesn't really make sense to me. It's fine. Um, <laughs> a woman on the Isle of Wight, white as in W-I-G-H-T, attempted to burn her painting... Okay and it didn't work basically and she claimed that she had bad luck after that um a man in nottingham he had a print of the painting and he lost his home and his family were also injured in the fire wait sorry i don't know if that was a fire it's not specified but it could be um (laughs) <laughs> a pizza parlor in Norfolk was destroyed, including every single painting on its walls, except for the crying boy. Um, so even, like, the Sun was reporting that rational firefighters refused to have, it, have a copy of the crying boy in their homes. So that basically just kind of sold it as, like, this really cursed thing. And so you have to also realize that most of these are prints, they're copies of it. And so that kind of brings into this conversation about well can a curse travel through copies because we kind of talked about that with the movie the ring and how like that's a copy of the original Mm -hmm. video um but i don't know and is there a way to break the curse like did that woman have a run of bad luck forever (laughs) like um uh, no well yeah no there is no way to break the curse oops (laughs) (laughs) So, Andre has spoken. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> fucked. 
So the sun actually decided in 1985 on Halloween to um, <laughs> kind of solve this, which is really weird. I've never heard of like a journalistic outlet trying to solve a curse, but they mm -hmm. were like, hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to collect hundreds of these paintings and we're going to burn them under the supervision of the fire brigade. <laughs> So they actually did that. Like, that's something that happened. Um, and I don't know if that maybe broke the curse or if it just, you know, was something for them to do on a Saturday night on Halloween. Either way, it sounds pretty fun. Yeah. I wish I could have been there. Um, so what would cause these paintings in particular to be cursed, aside from the fact that it's just children crying? Well, there's some theories that the the iconic, like... I want to hear... I want to hear that the painter did like a deal with the devil or something. Ooh, that you know, yeah, actually, yeah, it was maybe. like a witch. It was like a witch or something. But mm, I just wonder, like, if you're making a deal with the devil to make it so that your paintings cause pain and suffering for other people, like, what was so good that you would trade that, you know? Or I guess like, you don't really care because it's not you, you know? Yeah, um, I don't know, like fame, money. I don't know that this painting had either of those though. So yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I don't know how much he would make. I mean, they were mass produced, but I'm not sure what artists actually get for those types of things, like those fucking yeah. okay, fine. prince of fruit bowls. Which storyline go? <laughs> so one theory is that the little boy who's in the iconic um, crying boy photo was a gypsy child. And his family placed a curse on the artist. So the boy supposedly died in a fire and his spirit was trapped in the painting. Um, I guess, you know, <laughs> I don't really know what, why that would be like a curse. Like, did the artist do something to him? Why did they blame the artist? All he did was paint him. But I don't really like that theory. Um, yeah. So another story claims that the crying boy accidentally set fire to the studio of the artist who painted him. Um, one says that the parents of the child had been killed in a blaze. And um, I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> Is that part of the curse? <laughs> oh gosh, that was a sneeze. Okay. <laughs> so um, there's... One theory that because his parents had been killed wherever the little orphan went, fires mysteriously followed, earning him the nickname of the devil. And the boy supposedly survived to be an adult, but was killed when his car crashed and burst into flames. And then his image was the one that carried his cursed fascination with fire. And that's a direct quote from the article. That's one of the theories. And that one's interesting. It's a little convoluted, but... Um, I don't know it can make sense if there's like some kind of residual curse that carries on if you yourself have like a lot of trauma and angst like maybe that's also energy that can form in the universe and stick to things but i don't know that's a little new agey i mean yeah i, I kind of believe in that like i mean isn't that literally like part of the plot of like a silent hill movie that like like, I don't know if you've, I don't know if you even heard about this or like play the game or watch the movie, but like, basically there's this girl who like goes through so much, or it's the second Silent Hill movie. Sorry, there's this girl that like suffers through so much, that like she like her pain and anger become, like a literal physical being that looks just like her, but mm -hmm. like, basically with like dark hair and like evil and like always wet and shit, like some Mara from the Ring, um. Wow, I, uh, that's a thing. I mean, that's a thing in the side guys. It's certainly a, 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 you know, a blood device in this. Yeah. Um. So I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, and that's also kind of what we were talking about. Poltergeist were too. It's just like that angry energy. Um. So yeah, maybe yeah. it's just a poltergeist that follows a painting. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, mm -hmm. and here's kind of the theories that debunk it. Um. Or at least try to debunk it. So. A fire brigade actually pointed out that a lot of these cases where, ha where there had been fires um, could be traced back to human carelessness or electrical problems. Um, the one thing they couldn't explain was why the paintings remained intact when everything around them was destroyed. Um, in a 2010 video, this guy Steve Punt, he put it on YouTube and 
he set the crying boy fire or sorry painting on fire to decide like to see what would happen basically and by the time the fire burned out the corner of the painting was scorched but it was mostly intact um and so there's one theory, <laughs> and this is very, very simple. The theory is that all of the Crying Boy paintings were printed onto fire retardant materials. <laughs> mm, I mean, if that's true, that's super lame, but I guess it would explain it. <laughs> yeah, I don't even, I, I don't know anything about fire resistant products. So I don't know if that would cost more or less money, if that would be something that you would be interested in doing. I don't, I don't really know. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe we'll do a test run. We'll get one of these paintings and we'll set it on fire and see what happens, you know? Yeah. Have fun. <laughs> I'm not coming near <laughs> any one of these paintings. Oh I'm my good. God. <laughs> Even though it's just a print. Why don't you bring a, why, why don't you bring in the painting and then like just a Ouija board alongside it just just for funsies like I mean might as well right hey I do want you to know that I'm getting very very close to doing the Ouija board because I actually found someone who's willing to do it with me so I am gonna puke no <laughs> don't do why it. does this bother you if I'm doing it and I live 12 hours away Shannon, I don't want to I don't want you to be put in danger um I don't know what to say to that because I'm always in danger <laughs> Every time I wake up, I could slip and fall in the bathtub, Andre. You know this. I mean, <laughs> I don't know that it's, like, imminent danger, though. Like, I mean, or rather, I don't know if it's consciously chosen danger. Like, if you if you play the Ouija, like, you decided to do that. Like, any consequences that come from that, like, you, you really, like, you will be blamed for that. Like, if you fall in, like, if you slip and fall in the tub, like, you can be blamed for that. <laughs> Zozo has been curled up my ass since like episode 14 <laughs> um just waiting to come out so I think honestly you're right yeah just let him out <laughs> Poor guy. Uh, okay so do you have any further thoughts on this because I'm gonna move on otherwise yeah I mean I mm, like <laughs> Now that you mentioned the flame retardant material, like the paintings being painted onto that, now that you mentioned that, I mean, I think that that could have a lot of merit probably, but I'm not going to go with that just because that sounds so boring and lame. I'm going to say, um, uh, Gypsy Child. I'm going to say Gypsy Child and, uh, the parents didn't like the painting, the painter painting the child because, um, well, they it's... believe paintings are a portal to the... <laughs> I don't know. I'm just pulling this out of my ass. Like, Well, don't you think it's kind of like how 21st century parents don't want you taking pictures of their kids and posting it on social media? <laughs> I guess it's kind of equivalent, isn't it? Yeah. It's like, why are you painting my child? And in this case, like, they would have to be sitting still for a long time. So maybe they thought that was creepy that he was spending so much time painting their child. Yeah, so I'm going to go with that, <laughs> but um, even if it's the flame retardant material theory, even if that's the one that's, I, I don't know that, I mean, it's called flame retardant for a reason, like it delays the burning, but it doesn't stop it. And I wonder if like, how long were these house fires like happening for? Because if they were like taking place for hours, then the painting would have eventually caught on fire. Like these fire retardant materials, these fire retardant like sprays and coats, they don't last forever so the fact that they the paintings were still untouched like even if they had flame retardant on them that's still pretty spooky like especially if they were involved in house fires that went on blazing for a while you know yeah um so i don't know dude I don't know. Kind of spooked. Well, also, I, I'm no fire expert, but, like, obviously, I come from a place where there were crazy fires, and um, yeah. it burns really, really hot hell. to the point. That's where Shannon comes from. She comes from hell. I come from hell. If you were... <laughs> if you had any doubts about that already, I just want to clear that up. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, like, my friends, when their house burned down, um, you know, like, the fridge was ashes. Like, the metal things were, like, basically all burned up, too, because that's how hot it burns. So mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe some of these stories have been exaggerated, and maybe not all the house burned down, you know? Maybe it wasn't as extreme as yeah. we're talking, but I just, I don't know. I don't know, and I... Yeah, let's hope so. Otherwise, we got a curse in our hands, and, you know, God forbid you ever take a... You ever get too close, or become uh an owner of one of these paintings and boy oh boy 
I feel like what's really realistically going to happen is people are going to be like, oh, I heard about this on a podcast. I'm going to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so actually, you know what? Fuck it. People can do whatever they want and nothing we say is going to stop him. So literally, go ahead. This episode um, was sponsored uh, by Giovanni. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, you can find his paintings at <laughs> Giovanni.com. Okay. Um, uh, let's move on. Okay, so... I definitely went in a um, kind of witchy direction with this because that's kind of what I was aiming for when I was thinking about curses as an episode idea. Why? What? Why am I not surprised? Shannon going in a witchy direction? I know, right? Who would be surprised? Um, you'll be pleased to know that it's not your typical witch, though. We're going to be talking about Greek um, witchcraft. Um, hmm, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about Degina. Do you know what that is? Um, I mean, as a gay man. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Dagina. I can't tell you that I know what it is. Uh, I can tell you that I know of it. <laughs> okay, but but really, we're talking about Dagina. D a g i n a. So, <laughs> just like, just maybe you're wrong, and maybe it's Dagina, which is a little better. It might be Dagina, um, or Dagina. Let's just go with that, because otherwise I will not stop laughing the whole time. I have not heard of Dagina. <laughs> Dagina. Anyway, so... <laughs> so Dagina was a Grecian... I don't know if you would call her witch. I don't know what we're going to be referring to her as. Um, but she was a feisty girl. Um, so we're going to be talking about the, the Pella Curse Tablet, which is an item, but it's also... It's, it's just containing the curse. The curse is a written form. It's basically a spell. Um, okay. And so on this tablet is distinct Doric Greek. Um, and it's, it's the, the Pella tablet itself is like a metal type stone that it's inscribed on like a scroll. So it's like a thin sheet of like metal that's, um, that's what would you call it, I guess, inscribed, but mm. like really yeah I, I understand the picture you're painting yeah it's just i wish i was better explaining things <laughs> so um this actually came from 375 to 350 bc um or bce i don't know what we're referring to it uh, this is just the article i'm looking at same um, thing shedding you're fine <laughs> So it, this is actually one of four known texts that um, represent a dialectical form of ancient Greek in Macedonia. And so one of the boring ways of interpreting this is like, wow, the Macedonians did speak Greek as well, um, which is what a lot of people like to focus on. For me, obviously, I'm not focusing on that. I'm focusing on the fact that this Greek dialect <laughs> is a spell. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so this spell was written by a woman and we think her name was Dagina um, it, it, that's our interpretation of it so Dagina <laughs> wrote the spell with the intention to cause her former lover to marry her and you know even in 350 BC like single bitches be trying you know what I'm saying like it's rough out here like <laughs> we're trying our best like I'm not saying that she was right but this was a different time so she crazy she wasn't right but I mean you can blame her okay listen I understand <laughs> I understand we understand why she's crazy um <laughs> So this is described as a mixed curse because it's a supplicative um, appeal and supplication, as you know, is asking for something. Um, so she was asking mm -hmm. for something to the divine powers. And if you took any history class, you know that the Greeks had a lot of gods, um, a lot of gods, mm -hmm. all which represented something different. And so it's not really surprising that there would be magic in this time. Oh, fun fact. Um... I do know that the Greeks actually had a goddess of witchcraft. Her name was um, Hecate. Oh, yeah, or Hecate. He yeah, I think that's how you pronounce it. Yeah, so, yeah, so, fun fact for everyone. And, yes, they had a bunch of gods, yes. Good, we're actually going to be talking briefly about Hecate, so that's that's good. So, this is what you would call a love charm. Um, and so, her lover, Dion, De Dion Siphon, I don't know how you say these Greek names. Dionsophone. <laughs> okay, so he is about to marry Thetima, um, which means she who honors the gods. And I don't know why 
Dio was all up on the t- the Tima when he had Dagina. Like, what was he doing behind Dagina's back? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you you had the Dagina. Why did you have to go to the Hatima? <laughs> or maybe he didn't even like Dagina, and Dagina was just stalking him, like Fair. eating yeah. grapes yeah. behind a tree. Um, <laughs> so Dagina invokes Macron and the demons. And literally, that's like, that's what it says. Demons. Deimosi. <laughs> um, mm, okay. Uh, to cause Dionosophone to marry her instead of the Tima. And Dejina wanted him to never, ever marry another woman unless she herself recovered and unrolled the scroll, thus making the curse obsolete. She wished herself to grow old by his side. And that's kind of what this scroll was encapsulating. Although, if you actually read the translation, it's a lot darker than just like, oh, please don't marry anyone else. It's like, hell no, you are not going to marry anyone else, basically. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, usually curses have to carry some kind of a gravitas in their wording. So, right. and she was, I understand. She was invoking demons, too. Like, this wasn't like, oh, please, Persephone. Like, no, no, no. She was... Vagina does not mess around. <laughs> call me maybe. This was no call me maybe. This was fuck me now. Right. Exactly. So I there's no information on if this worked. We don't really know what happened to Dagina after this. Um, but that's the curse. And now I want to focus on this in a kind of a deeper, I want to say deeper historical context, drawing from an article that was published May 26, 2016. Um, by Natalia Klimzak. So it's called Ancient Witchcraft and the Spell of the Pelicurse Tablet. So there have been about 1,600 tablets that have been discovered in this Greek language. Um, And so obviously this isn't incredibly unique, but it is a cursed tablet, which is really cool. And something this this article mentions is that cursed tablets are also known as binding tablets and were actually pretty popular in Greece at the time, which I didn't know that. Like... You don't learn this in school because they don't want you to know. <laughs> they don't want you to know this. Yeah, probably because they don't want you to try it at home. And, oh, like, yeah. Put, and we're going to be doing like, that later. Love spells and everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so just to kind of reiterate, this was a way to talk to the gods, the goddesses, the spirits, and get some support in order to get rid of a problem, get rid of a person, you know, make something happen. The ancient Greeks would mess around with herbs and fire to try and make the spell stronger. And um, they would be created with stones or baked clay to make sure that the spell survived for a long time. And they were called catadesmoi, desmoi, uh, or defixiones. I like how I'm putting like a Spanish accent on this and it's Greek, so I don't actually know what it would sound like. <laughs> Listen, I don't blame you. Like you couldn't ask me what it sounds like because I wouldn't be able to tell you either. <laughs> yeah, so that's what they're called. Those are the kind of spells. And as long as the text exists, supposedly the curse is supposed to still be in action. So for all we know, Dejina and that dude are, you know, they got married, had nine kids, but we don't know. Uh, hmm. That's the happy ending anyway. I mean, is that happy? Because he didn't want to be with her. Consent is key, guys. I don't know. Yeah, no. It's not happy. (laughs) (laughs) That's terrible. Like, I always think of love charms as like, God, that's so like, like, I guess you could say there's a somewhat noble intent behind, I mean, if you think they're real at all, right? A noble intent behind love charms, but like, (laughs) in reality, it's super fucked. And if anything, the person who's like placing the love charm is going to be fucking sad too, because like... Like, uh, do you really want to be with basically like a zombie? Like this person will only quote unquote love you because like you made them do so. So, and that's I don't know. That's definitely what's know. scary about it too is like using that type of power for something so like gross and manipulative. Like that's creepy. So, um, yeah, it's partially just scary because like I never knew like the Greeks did this or you know like in these ancient mm-hmm. times. But also it's scary because like why Dejina? Why were you like this? Like, it's like, what is that? <laughs> Fatal attraction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So. Um, well, I like that. Hey, that I'm not even curse. done. <laughs> Why oh, are you okay. cutting me off? Well, <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, 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 no. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Please don't tell the Gina. <laughs> the Gina will come for you. She's crazy. So, um, <laughs> 
So just more information on like what they were doing. Um, some curses were made for lawsuits, love spells, which we touched on, theatrical curses, trade curses. Um, What's a theatrical curse? I don't know. I actually wondered that too. I'm like, maybe it has something to do with like just cursing someone to like dance for five hours, you know, or like. Interesting. Hmm. I like that. Yeah. Just something that's like you can see on the outside and it really affects them. So <laughs> you cut me off right before it was about to get good. So I actually found <laughs> on <laughs> Weebly, which I guess is like this like form setting up site. <laughs> I don't know. The source of all human information and knowledge. Yes, exactly. So this is the city full of gods, Weebly. Um, actually, no, no, no. Sorry, I'm going to skip over that because we don't really have time. It, yeah, I don't have time to talk about that. So can you mark that? It's like 53. Um, so yeah. I'm going to talk about Amino Apps, which I guess is an app. And it's an app where you can have like groups and you can talk to each other. And so this was found on the Pagan and Witches Oh my group. god, is this our first sponsor? What's going on? No, they totally aren't. But they should sponsor us. <laughs> um, Thank you, Amino, for sponsoring <laughs> us. Everyone go check out the app. Link in the description. No, no, no. They will be so mad. They'll be like, we are not sponsoring this trash. <laughs> like, <laughs> lawsuit, <laughs> what up? No. Um, anyway, so... I, uh, in the Pagans and Witches group, I actually found someone named Shy, who posted this on April 10th, who gave instructions on how to make a cursed tablet. So I thought I would share it with everyone at home who wants to make their own. <laughs> Ooh, okay. <laughs> just don't use it for anything creepy. Um, you know, like if you want to like... We promise. <laughs> just if you want to get better grades or if you want to curse the dog that keeps pooping on your lawn, like let's keep it very, very like within the realm of legality. Like, let's do that. Um, <laughs> So, Shy gives some context for this. <laughs> they say that, well, for one, they kind of go over what we already know. It's like, it needs to be on pottery or metal, and it needs to keep existing and remain intact. Um, and then they also kind of put in something I didn't know, which is that these tablets are not meant to be seen by other people. So, to keep people from looking at the spells is to just fold it or roll it up or nail it shut, which explains why Dejaina rolled hers up. Wow, amazing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And another good way, they say, is to throw it down a well or put it in a grave. Um, you know, All right. <laughs> make sure it lasts for a long time because also apparently throwing it down a well gets it closer to the underworld, so. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> Okay, so this person is going to tell you how to do this. So um, one way, aside from just putting it on metal or clay and just writing it out, you can do a wax or clay figurine. And so that's kind of very similar to a voodoo doll. Um, <laughs> so they say, like, make, like, a wax figure or a clay figure of the person or thing you want to curse. And then you just distort the body. Sorry, distort the body of the figurine. And poke it with a needle, you know. Do <laughs> no, distort you your body. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then you can just dispose of it like you would with a normal tablet. Um, you can <laughs> you can throw it down a well. You can put it in the earth. Just make sure that it lasts a very long time. And yeah, so that's one method. And then there's one other method called the simple man's tablet where you make the tablet, but you make it very, very small. And all you do is just write down the person's name. <laughs> and so this is, this is more like a spell where you're going to be thinking or saying out loud the information that you would have been writing down on the tablet, but it's the same theory. Just throw it into the ground, make sure it gets close to hell. And there you go. You got a curse that will supposedly <laughs> last forever. Um, Yay! Yeah, so I thought I would share that with everyone because I'm a bad person, but um, please don't do anything weird. <laughs> but you're also a good person. And listen, um, uh, if someone's going to do a love charm, they're going to do it anyway, so they might as well be getting reliable information from a source <laughs> like you. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> that's worse. <laughs> okay, so yeah, that's what I have for you. What do you think? Um, uh, I am trying a love course tonight. Um, gonna make, um, who am I gonna make fall in love with me? Um, 2009 Taylor Lautner. Can the curse make you go back in time? I don't um, see why not. 
<laughs> um, that is cool and also scary and also I hate it. Like, it, basically, just to reiterate what I said earlier, like, love curses to me are so tricky because, like, I, like, you gotta understand, like, the yearning that the cursor has, but you also have to understand, like, how terrible the victim of the curse yeah. is, like, being treated because, like, they literally don't want to be there. And in the end, even the cursor, like, you would like that. Again, like, you would like that. Like, you know they don't actually love you you know it's all just like black magic and shit if it indeed works like would you actually be okay with that and happy with that i think it's just yeah. a representation of the the person casting the curse is just a really broken person and this is really the only way that they can see that happening and so i think it's more of a psychological like analysis to be like well if you're doing this then obviously you need to seek help um but <laughs> yeah so Ugh, yeah. i stand our psychological analysis this should be psych talk for real yeah. um uh we're starting a new podcast, everyone. It's going to be called Psych Talk. And it's going to come out on Tuesdays, which really means Thursday nights. And <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> link in the description down below. We'll be putting out episode one soon. Uh, it is going to be sponsored by Amino. So, if Amino apps would um, like to sponsor uh, us, please DM us <laughs> on Twitter. <laughs> Yeah, we're already shouting you out. Great app. Um, uh, love the you know user friendly platform. So if we're already giving you a good word. You contact us, please. DM us at Talk Scary. Not the audience talking to Amino right now, but onto the audience. Everyone, thank you for listening. Um, you can also DM us at uh, Talk Scary on Twitter or at Scary Talk on Facebook, and you can listen to us on all podcast listening platforms: Spotify, Apple Music, iHeartRadio, I um, Stitcher, TuneIn, etc., etc. Shannon, any last thoughts? Degina. One, Degina. Two, the Mothman's Degina. <laughs> and <laughs> and three, um, uh, don't eat any large meals before bed. Um, uh, thank you for listening. We will uh, talk to you next week and uh, keep it spooky. Good night. Bye.